Okay, so I'm Chris Batters and I'm part of the biophysics facility here at the LMB. And today I'm going to talk about single molecule techniques. So I'm going to go through sort of the theory of why we actually would do these type of experiments. And then in specific, specifically, I'm going to talk about three pieces of equipment we have here at the LMB and the types of things we can do with them and some examples of the experiments we've done. So why would we measure single molecules? What's the, what's the point of measuring single molecules? Well, you can see that obviously there's lots of ways to get the same average. If we do ensemble experiments, you can always get this average. But in fact, if you looked at the single molecules, you might find there's a lot of different things going on in the background. So properties of ind individual molecules reveal distinct populations. Single molecule events also allow us to look at rare events or things that you would miss when you do a big ensemble experiment. Um, so observing with time reveals the stochastics and mechanistic dynamics of individual molecules. It also, single molecule experiments also allow, to, allow us to um, mechanically control so we can actually alter the single molecules and see what effect putting strain, putting load onto um, proteins can do. So many biological reactions are just too complex to fully understand using ensemble techniques. Um, you may find that you actually do single molecule experiments. You may be forced to do them just by simply by the amount of material you can create. So sometimes it's just not it's just not practical to create large amounts of proteins. And you may only, especially in um, some of these large complexes, you, you may have to do them. Um, people often want to do single molecule experiments when they basically form the hypothesis from the structures and then you get reviewers comments or such things then single molecule can be a good way because it's you with when you've done things like cry in the end it's kind of the sort of amounts of protein you created in the first place okay so the first single molecule experiments were by Sackman and Nea so these were patch clamp experiments and this was back in 1976 which they went on obviously to win the Nobel Prize for but since then, you can see, obviously, numbers have gone up a lot. But down most years now, it's around 10,000 papers per year. There's a lot of different types of single molecule experiments, obviously. Some of them are imaging, some of them are mechanical. So this is the sort of thing we see a lot here, obviously, cryo-EM structures, crystallographic structures, and then super-resolution structures. So these are all, obviously, the amazing and strong resolution. Um, but where single mo say it's not sort of true to life, as we say. So these are all static stat snapshots of what we're actually seeing. And we know obviously in the real world, there's browning motion, there's hydration, the molecules are moving very fast, there's crowding effects. So what we what we lose with single molecule experiments in terms of atomic resolution, we gain things as in, it's very cheap in cost in the terms of cost of materials required. We can do the experiments in physiological conditions, so we can choose any buffers, temperatures, control, reactants. It's always solution-based, so we're looking at molecules diffusing and undergoing stochastic processes. And then that's what allows us to see these rare events. We should be able to, with single molecule experiments, you should be able to build up a single molecule and it should recreate the ensemble. Okay, so strategies for single doing single molecule work. Obviously, we need to get down to to low numbers. So sometimes people talk about single molecules and, and it's not actually looking at one molecule. It might be looking at tens of molecules or even hundreds of molecules. But obviously, this is still you know, a huge amount smaller than, than most other techniques. There's seven cases where we do actually look at individual molecules. So one strategy is obviously to reduce the concentration so you can just dilute down, keep diluting down and do it that way. Another strategy is to actually use a limited observation volume. So basically create sort of a confocal type illumination or on the surface using turf illumination and then you can look at the molecules binding to the surface. Obviously a problem with this is you have to have very strong optical signals. So you need to use bright fluorophores with a high QE or use very strong illumination. So then you have to be careful when you do the experiments because you can get you have to be careful that what you're monitoring isn't photo bleaching. So some practicalities of single molecule techniques. So for most of the techniques, 
you're going to have to attach a fluorescent label onto your molecule of interest or one of the molecules of interest. And obviously that can affect the protein. So often you need to do lots of controls. The best approach is to actually have just a single fluorophore on each molecule. And then that requires mutagenesis or creating fusion proteins. Instrumentation can often be very complex. So traditionally, a lot of single molecule work was all very much done on home built apparatus, of which we have some here at the LMB. We've also got some commercial instruments, which then obviously become a bit more user friendly. To be careful at single molecule concentrations, because obviously this can affect how stable complex formations are. And also, you can have a problem with things absorb into the surface when you're only at very low numbers. And then also, if you haven't attached a fluorophore, so if you're doing some type of mechanical experiment, you may have to immobilize the molecule in some way. And again, this may perturb the system. So you're going to have to have controls. So single molecule experiments in general can be reveal a lot of information, but they can be quite complicated. So it's important that you think carefully and design the experiment carefully before you start and think, is it the best way to answer the question you have? Okay, so these are the three techniques that I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about FCS, which is on a home-built system. I'm going to talk about the optical tweezers, which is um, by Lumix. So this is a commercial system that we got um, just over a year ago. And then I'm going to talk about mass photometry, which is something um, made by company by Refine, which we have here. So I'm not going to talk about other things. So turf-based systems, AFM, um, patch clamp, there's all sorts of other things at the LFP, which we have, but I'm not going to talk about those. Okay, so FCS is fluorescent correlation spectroscopy. What we do here is basically dilute the sample down, have a fluorophore on the protein or proteins of interest, and then we create a very small volume, so usually a confocal size volume. We then look at fluctuations of fluorescence that enter into this illumination spot. So it's a very sensitive technique. It uses small numbers of molecules, not always single molecule, but certainly down to, down to picomolar concentrations and say tens to hundreds of molecules. In contrast to other methods, there's no physical separation. So we can actually look at the molecules in, in physiological buffer and the spatial resolution is obtained using, just using optics. And this is what the system looks like that we have here. So we've got four different lasers. These are all connected up uh, through this um, fiber coupler, it goes into the microscope through pinholes, and then we have this confocal volume. The advantage of it, uh, one of the advantages of this being a home-built system is that it's it's quite easy to modify and change. So in the past, Chris Johnson has, has changed this. So he's created it so we can do FRET experiments. So he collects the, collects the light to this side and looks at exception donor. Or we can do FCS, so you can do correlations, FCCS, which I'm going to talk about in a bit by splitting here. Um, obviously, it allows us to drop lots of different filters in and do different types of experiments, depending on the type of questions you have. So just to quickly, the sort of things we need. So samples are very standard. It's a standard inverted microscope. So we can basically use any buffer, any, any type of um, container. Often we have to passivate so that we don't have things sticking. We can use these dimple slides so we can use very small volumes, or we quite often use these trays now. So when we do FCS, what we're looking at, we put have fluorescent molecules in, the fluorescent molecule into the, the nation, and we'll get a signal. And then at time zero, we get a fluctuation. So we get this fl fluorescent signal. And then we look at T plus delta tau, so a different time point further along, and we actually ask, how well correlated is that molecule to how it was? So obviously at time zero, it's perfectly correlated. At time one, it's the molecule has moved on, so it's not as correlated. And then time three, it's not correlated at all. So that's this autocorrelation function, a complex formula as in to actually solve it. It takes a lot of um, computer power, but we can do this with 
it's actually done with a piece of hardware so the autocorrelation function can be done in real time. So what we see here is that this is an autocorrelation function. So at time zero, we have one where they're perfectly correlated. And then depending on the speed of the molecule and how quickly it's diffusing, what's going on with the molecule, this correlation drops down to zero. And by so if we have a lot of fluctuations, it's, it's very dynamic. If we've got no fluctuations, it's static. So you can do this with molecules in solution, or you can do them um, stuck in lipids or stuck onto the surface and look at them diffusing around. So, but what does the curve actually tell us? So depending on where this curve is, the inflection point shows that we have slower diffusion. Depending on the height here that gives us the actual concentration, we can, and then what you have to do is actually, we get the curve. It's not always a simple curve like this. It can be a curve. It can have steps in because there can be sort of restricted motion, two different patches. So when you get your F correlation curve, you have to fit it. And when you fit it, it allows you then to look at, you can get the diffusion coefficients, hydrodynamic uh, radii, and you can look at um, kinetic chemical reaction rates as well. So on our system, we also have this fluorescence cross-correlation spectroscopy. This is, this is advantageous for a lot of experiments because obviously when you're looking at single molecules, you can get um, basically background noise. So you get, you get this um, process called after pulsing where you get a, a false signal. But if we split the signal into two channels, it means that both of these have to be um, give a signal at the same time for it to be truly a reaction. That means we get um, much, much less artifacts. Very <laughs> Another thing you can do is, um, is you could label the proteins of interest with two different fluorophores. But then in that way, you could have a green and a red fluorophore. When they're bound together, you'd get the green signal here, the red signal here, and we'd only get this autocorrelation. They both went through together. Uh, with FCCS, we get all the same things we get with FCS, but we have this advantage of less noise. So the other thing we can do with FCS is actually look at fret measurements. And um, obviously the fret signal is a lot weaker than using normal fluorescence. And with fret, the advantage is we do go down to almost proper single molecule experiments. So we go much more dilute. What we have, and we, we sort of set the system so that we look at we have a donor, and when we get an acceptor burst at the same time, we'd say that this is a threat signal. So this, we always get this zero peak here, and this is uh, donor molecules on their own. But when we get a threat signal, we get the measurement here. So we can construct these threat histograms from these um, pulses that we see. And Chris Johnson used this to answer this question. So he was looking at protein folding, and they wanted to know if they had this high energy barrier transition state. So do they unfold in two states or does it, is it a gradual system? So how he looked at that was he basically took his protein and added um, guanidinium chloride in different concentrations, one molar, two molar, three molar. And so ignore the zero peak, but here you can see we get a threat signal. And then as it is denatured, we get a second peak and it's just two distinct peaks. When it's completely denatured, we just have this one peak here. So that proved that it was a high energy barrier transition state. So the threat, threat with FCS is actually a pretty powerful technique. And uh, these are some other examples. So he's, where he's looked at ultra fast folding and it's all sorts of papers that are on the um, biophysics website. You can look at examples of things he's done. Okay, the second technique I'm going to talk about is optical tweezers. So I'm going to give a little bit of background on what an optical tweezer is, and then I'm going to show you some experiments that we've done with them. Okay, so I think it was uh, Kepler observed this phenomenon in the 17th century where it doesn't matter which direction the comet's moving, it can be moving towards the sun or away from the sun, but the tail will always point away from the sun because of the photon pressure of the sun. So nothing much was done with this then for a few, this sort of phenomenon for a few hundred years. And then um, in 1986, they, we created 
we scientists created this optical trap. So it was a single beam, uh, so it was a counter propagating beam trap. So this was two lasers pointing at each other to create a trap in the middle. And then Stephen Chu won the Nobel Prize for this in 1997 in physics. This was obviously, he did a lot of, this was obviously sort of hardcore physics where he was sort of trapping atoms. Whereas Ash, Arthur Ashkin, who developed a lot of these techniques and actually developed the single beam trap. And that's the single beam trap is what's called the optical tweezer because with a single beam, you could hold the beat. So he developed that. And luckily when he was uh, 97 years old, he actually got the Nobel Prize for that technique as well. So photon pressure is a crux radiometer and you can see that um, light carries energy, photons compress. Photons hit things and it can, and this energy can move things around. So for many years, people thought this was a good example of photon pressure, but actually a crux radiometer is, isn't. It's a heat engine. It only doesn't work in a complete vacuum. Luckily, uh, Nichols created something very similar and but just much a much more precise piece of equipment, much more delicate. And this in a complete vacuum, he proved that photon pressure was real. So the theory behind optical tweezers are that we can, if, if light goes into, um, you get basically two forces. We get a scattering force, which pushes a particle away from the light. You get the gradient forces, which will draw the particle towards the light. And this obviously only works in the micros microscopic world, small forces. So this sort of, um, if I'm going, so, so this is the, we have to, the trick to getting an optical tweezer is you have to have a Gaussian laser beam because you have to create this 3D profile of intensity. And by having a 3D profile of intensity, it means that the bead can be drawn to the part of highest intensity and therefore can be held stably in the trap. We can then move and manipulate the beads around and create the experiments. It's quite simple to actually create an optical tweezer. So all you really have to do is expand the laser beam. Usually we use an infrared laser beam. You have to expand it and you have to overfill the objective. If you do that, you'll create this high intensity uh, 3D, three dimensional gradient. The trick to obviously creating a single trap is quite straightforward. Obviously the complicated thing is controlling it, being able to move things around, imaging and putting all these things together. So optical forces are very small. It was Jack Vance calculated that it was 25 grams per acre of when the sun hits the, um, the ground. So basically a milliwatt beam creates, creates a peak and Newton of force. So to gravitate a football against gravity, you need a laser of this size, of which um, there is one, which is this. This is a person. This has a beam width of about a meter. So it's not really practical in any other term other than in the microscopic world. When we go to the microscopic world, if we look at some forces, entropic forces are very weak and like forces to pull DNA, for example, you're looking at four piconewtons. If we look at myosins and kinesins, they create around five piconewtons. Um, Biotin streptavidin bond, 200 piconewtons, and then a covalent bond, 1600 piconewtons. So that's actually beyond optical tweezers. The ones we the ones we have here are actually very powerful. They've got a 10 watt um, infrared laser, but it will cr create around 1000 piconewtons of force maximum. M nearly every experiment you do, you're going to use much, much less than this. If you actually were looking at to create this kind of force, there's, there's other techniques you're probably better with the AFM or um, yeah, something not an optical tweezer. But you can create high forces and measure high forces if you need to. And this is what it looks like. So it's, as I said, it's a commercial instrument. So it's, it's all contained. It's got, obviously the lasers are powerful, so they're dangerous, but it's all contained interlocks. So, Quite quickly, you can be trained on this and, and use this piece of equipment. I'm oh, sorry. It's controlled with, most of the things are controlled with the joystick and you can say within sort of 
a few hours, you can become quite competent with this piece of equipment, as opposed to a home-built piece of equipment, which might take you weeks. Um, so the system that we have here, we have three color system. It's got wide field and turf. We've got three laser lines. We also have IRM imaging and interference microscopy, which is really useful. Got bright field imaging. It's temperature controlled, so room temperature up to 37 degrees. With this, we can obviously measure the position and apply forces. And this system also has a microfluidic flow chamber as well, which is um, you can design some quite good experiments with. So I'm going to go through some of these points. The thing with the sea trap is obviously you can also measure all these things simultaneously. So you can collect everything at once. Whereas some of the older pieces of equipment could only do mechanical experiments, but you could only image. So this allows you to do everything at once. So when you design an experiment with an optical tweezer, nearly all experiments are designed around beads. So you need to have one micron or you can use slightly bigger or you can use slightly smaller beads and you coat the bead with the molecule of interest that you want to study. And then you can either use this um, like a one bead system where you may have a motor on a track and you may apply forces to it, or you might have a two bead system where you tether things between. So for instance, DNA, RNA, in microtubules or even people directly attach proteins and look at conformation changes. The point being that there are a few examples where people have trapped bacteria and done certain experiments, um, but it's much, much better if you design it around um, one of these handles. You can use beads of different sizes, so you can have different chemistries on, on the beads um, to allow you to set up the experiment so you know what's happening, or you can obviously use different colors. This is the microfluidic system that we have on the C-trap. So this is a standard uh, flow cell we, we have where we have five channels where we get laminar flow. So we actually can create five separate channels. So one of the experiments that are done, you can, for instance, you can capture the beads in this lane. You can then go to move across to this lane and capture DNA. You then, once you have, a, once you have your dumbbell pair where you have the bead attached to the DNA, you may go into a second lane and look at how this protein attaches or a second protein or go to an empty channel and where there's no fluorescence and, and see and monitor it in there. So, it's, so you can imagine you can actually design lots of different experiments where you have different things in these channels and move the beads around into the different channels to create your experiment. The alternative to using this is to create, we can just make your own channel. So sometimes you just want to put everything into the chamber and seal the chamber and then do your experiments. I've done quite a lot of experiments with this method because sometimes we, you use slightly more material with this, or it may just be the fact that you don't want to change. You don't want to change the um, solutions. When I was looking at microtubules growing, obviously I wanted to keep the microtubule concentration quite high, so the sealed chamber was the way to do it. Okay, so then when, if we look at the interference reflection microscopy, very briefly, it allows us to look at things that are very close to the surface. So if, a, if something is very close to the surface, you get this uh, destructive interference and you get a black signal. If things are further away, you get the, we get a white signal. So this allows us to look at, so for instance, these are microtubules on the seed trap. These are growing microtubules and you can see Obviously, you don't need to use any fluorescent labels, so you, you can use very low light power. You're not going to do any, any um, photo bleaching, any damage to these, um, which is, can be quite important. It allows long-term imaging. Um, also allows you to do sort of multiple, you can set up multiple things where obviously you can look at the IRM signal, but then you can have your fluorescent signal on top, look at the fluorescence binding to the microtubules. Or in this case, we used um, we used 488, so blue microtubules we used as seeds. Then the seeds we used to then bind to the surface, and then we grew the non fluorescent uh, microtubules on top. So here's another example where we've got two beads, which are, you can see, are red. And then there's a piece of DNA between when we move this one bead. 
you can see that it pulls, and this is a single ATO dye that's on the DNA. So this is just a sort of test to show that the sort of thing we can do. Obviously, then you can um, do these chymographs and you can look at the molecules binding. Obviously, this, is, this didn't release, this was bleached, but if you've got them in solution, you can see them binding and releasing. So when we trap the beads, for example, we can control the stage. So if you see here, this is a bead trapped here. There's two beads, that one disappeared. But you can move the stage around while the bead stays in position. So you can move to the other chambers or you can move around to capture um, the things you need to for the experiment. Alternative to moving the stage, you can control the trap. So you can, this is a bead trapped. And you can move in X and you can move in Y. You can also, with this system, you can move in Z. So it allows us to, you can't measure forces in, in Z, so we can't sort of pull up or push down, but we can, you can change the height of the bead, which is useful for different experiments. Okay, so we can trap beads, we can use IRM, we can use, we can look at in fluorescent measurements, but we can also do mechanical measurements. This is where obviously the C trap or optical tweezers have their, st their strength. So once we've captured a bead, we calibrate the beads with um, various different various different methods to do it. The system we have uses a power spectrum method. Basically, depending on how big the bead is, the um, how close it is to the surface and how high the laser power is, it will give us a certain force. Once we've calibrated it, we can then, for instance, here, streptavidin bead bound to biotin. We can then pull on the bead. And as we pull on the bead, the forces increase until we rupture this bond. And then we can measure the force, which is actually around 200 picanewans. So these... This is a kind of typical force displacement curve that you could that you would get. Okay, so if we put all these things together, so this was some work done by um, Kylie, David Barford's group. So he obviously did this cryo EM structure, amazing structure of the Kineta core, and um, he got this structure and then he, he he analyzed it and sort of found certain parts. That he thought were interesting. So I'll just go over here. Um, he found these three different bits where he thought that there were connections. So what he wanted to do was to actually make mutants of the of these different constructs and then see if it made what, what effect it had. So we designed this experiment around a single bead. So it was one bead covered in NDC 80. And then we had the microtubules stuck to the surface of seeds, and then we grew dynamic microtubules. Um, we had then had the DAM1 complex, which binds to the microtubule, and then we bring this bead into the vicinity of here and let it bind. So something like this, so you bring the bead to the microtubule, you then let it bind to the microtubule that's growing, sort of moving around, and then we pull it away. And when we do that, we get this false displacement curve, so the false ramp, this is where it detaches. And then this is the rupture force that we measure. So he had a range of different mutants. He had some NDC80 mutants. He also had um, the DAM1 mutants, which he wanted to look at various combinations of. These are just some examples. So you can see here, obviously, different rupture points depending on, depending on the, um, the uh, mutation that was being tested. Obviously, when you do single molecule experiments, you can't just you know, measure one, one rupture force, next rupture force. You actually need to, because it's often these things can be kind of stochastic, you need to measure hundreds of them. And that's what we did here. So basically, all the different conditions. Um, so we've got, yeah, 150 measurements, 20 and 30. And then we plot them, and we can see the difference between um, these different mutations. And then he also did work where he threw these mutations in yeast and this confirmed that, that the mutations weakened the binding, weakened the kinetical. And that was published last year. The other things that we're doing with the C trap at the moment are looking at the bending and buckling of microtubules. So this is binding microtubules and then actually looking at drugs that bind microtubules and seeing how this affects the stiffness. We've got some experiments where we're looking at RNA, so binding RNA between the beads and 
we've just started this experiment where we're going to look at the other end of the kinetic arc and see with the cohesion ring and see how that and um, what sort of forces we create with the DNA. So you can look on the Lumix website and you can see the kind of they have this on their website and they have so all of these different sections and you can see there's sort of over a hundred publications now with their equipment and you can see the types of things that they can do. Okay, and the last piece of equipment I'm going to talk about is the uh, mass photometry. So this is a piece of equipment we have on the third floor. It's a piece of equipment I kind of think everyone who makes protein in the building should be trained on. I think it takes about 20 minutes to be trained to use it. And it's extremely powerful. It, I think often, you know, you can run your gel, you can get the molecular weight, but if you, for the sake of a few microliters of protein, you can go onto this machine and you can really get a lot of information from it, what it looks like. So it works by using, again, this interfer in interferometric scattering. And that's by looking at very small particles, this Riley scattering, which we'll talk about later in the uh, lecture series, but basically they scatter particles in all directions. In the past, we weren't able to see this. It was completely speckled and you wouldn't be able to see single molecules, but this company has managed to create a piece of equipment that can separate single molecule um, images from this large speckled background. They do this with this um, NA filtering, it allows it to get a high contrast. Again, so when a, when a bead goes to the surface, it scatters the light to get this destructive interference and allows us the interference is, is um, directly relates to the size of the protein. So we can create, um, you can actually see, depending on the, how much interference there is, depends on how big the protein is. So the good thing with mass photometry is it doesn't require any labels whatsoever. So you can just put your native protein into it. Our system can look at any protein greater than 50 kilodaltons. Um, you have to use, low concentration so between 10 and 100 nanomolar concentration um obviously if you got if you got the way the system works it needs to look at individual individual molecules binding to the surface you have too high a concentration it can separate and so often you need to do quite a big dilution it allows you to look at this, your sample heterogeneity look at self-association people have looked you can see if it's dimeric as long as it falls within the range basically anything over 50. Um, you can use it with nucleic acids. People have used it but with immobilized bilayers as well. We haven't done that here, but there are papers of where they've done it. You can also look at affinities. So as long as it's a, a, a low nanomolar interaction, you can look at binding affinities and it's extremely quick. This is what the system looks like. Basically a glass slide with a rubber gasket on. You put the your sample into that. And this is what it looks like. So as the molecules bind to the surface, you see them appear. They appear and disappear. They're not actually disappearing. They're binding and they stay bound, but it's because they do this sort of um, this frame averaging. So it does a running ratio. So if something's if something's stuck on the surface, it disappears. It looks like we'll get spots in the same position, but that's obviously just because the proteins are so small, it looks like they're binding in the same position. So within 60 seconds of create, collecting your sample, it's ready to analyze. It analyzes the individual spots. We determine the mass from a calibration curve of standards that we have. And so these are sort of calibrations of known size that we can basically create this calibration curve. If you're looking, we can go much higher than 800 kilodaltons. You can go megadaltons. We don't have things that are brilliant for, as a marker for, the, for things that are much higher. Um, but it can still be useful, sometimes not for absolute size, but it's good for looking at, is something binding to it? Is it dimerizing? Is it a trimer? Things like that. So here's some examples. So 15 microliters of sample, 50 nanomolar of protein, one minute. And you can see here that... The sequence said it would be 208 kilodaltons. We observed 205. This is a homodimer, which is done in a Williams lab. 
these are some more examples. So these got you know this technique is used a lot now, published in high quality journals, and yeah, sometimes it's used to actually answer a specific question. Sometimes it's just used to quality control. I think if you're going to go and you're going to do some cryo EM, it's worth spending two minutes putting your protein on here. Um, we've also used it where you can, you know, you can alter the buffers, change the buffers quickly, see what effect it has on the protein. So in summary, we've got several single molecule techniques here. They're very powerful, but they should only be used. Just think very carefully about the question you want to answer. And we've got FCS for looking at things moving in, in freely in solution and also threat experiments. Uh, mass photometry, which they say if you're making proteins, you should come and learn how to use. And then the C trap, which is an instrument which we're happy to train people to use. Or sometimes, uh, sometimes it's something that you might want to do in collaboration because it can be quite time consuming and you might want to invest the time yourself. Okay, further information, these are just some general, general books and papers which Chris Johnson recommended. And uh, thank you for coming. And if you've got any questions, please. Uh, strictly specific for the mass or for the size of the protein? Uh, yeah, so it's strictly for the mass, so the actual size doesn't affect the signal. So it doesn't, we don't get any information of, of the shape. So if it's, you know, elongated or or globular and things like that, it's, it's purely down to the mass. Um, it also works with nucleic acids as well. You just have to do a different calibration curve. Even if they're in like an elongated non, uh, non-coil form, it doesn't matter. Nope. I wanted to apply this to protein post-translation modifications, say ubiquitylation. Yeah. Do you think one could determine the fraction of a molecule that is modified ubiquitin? It's one ubiquitin, two, three ubiquitins? With the mass photometer. So you do get you do get peaks and you get this change in you get this change in peaks. Ubiquitin is quite small. Yeah. And <laughs> that if it was if it was only a bit bigger. Yeah, no, I, I think that would be beyond the, the resolution of it. You wouldn't. You might see the the shape of the. So there's there's some papers where people have you obviously have this distribution, and then they plot all sorts of Gaussians in the into the curve. But yeah, which is you know it's a legitimate thing to do. But yeah, you wouldn't see distinct peaks. It's, it's too small. It works best if you can add yeah something a bit bigger to it. Do you have an idea about the error rate? What what the machine can see? The error rate. Um, so it can't do anything less than fifth. The, the precision of the yeah, the precision. So I'd say within about ten percent of the size of the molecule. So it's yeah, you as long as you've got a, a, a good set of standards, it, it gives really surprise. Yeah, it gives really good results. So you sometimes have to. Um, you have to make your own calibration curve with your own, if you, you know, to match the buffer precise. And maybe, you know, if you're in a certain range, you might want to put some more controls into the lower end or higher end. But yeah, no, it's, um, it's actually really quite impressive results. And often some of these, some of these um, things that are in the, in papers that they've kind of, it's done once, they like measure it once, you get this beautiful distribution and that's it. So yeah, it's, re it's really good. Okay, thank you.